Welcome everybody to our very, I believe our very important panel. Uh, I think we're bringing you today some groundbreaking information. Uh, I know it's groundbreaking because I sought answers for some very serious problems that were affecting my playing and nearly ended my career. I sought uh, information for more than 20 years seeking out, I was seeking out uh, answers and going to many different excellent uh, practitioners who did not diagnose me properly. So I'm sure that you will find this to be very important. I wanna first uh, start out by introducing you to Dr. Mark and Dr. Marite Grothman who, who are joining me today. And uh, Dr. Mark, would you like to start uh, with talking a, a little bit about what you're, you're gonna discuss? Yes, thanks. Uh, what I'd like to do is begin by just setting up our session this morning for one hour. Uh, we're gonna start by having Kathy talk for maybe 10 minutes or so about her story and how she got introduced to the technique that we do, SOT, sacro-occipital technique. Uh, afterward, I'll probably spend about half an hour actually discussing uh, sacroiliac or pelvic chronic sprain condition and all the myriad of symptoms that it can cause. Uh, and then, of course, we'll leave about 10 minutes for uh, Q&A. Uh, I'll have Dr. Marite maybe uh, talk about a couple of interesting case histories that we've done. And uh, let's just go ahead and start with uh, Kathy's story. Okay. Um, I, I don't know, it, you know, if you know anything about uh, my background, but I am the clarinetist and executive director of the Orion Ensemble. We're in our 20th, 29th season this year. Um, I uh, was principal clarinet with the Lake Forest Symphony um, for 33 years. The orchestra folded uh, during COVID. So right after my Mozart concerto. Um, and I play extra with the Chicago Symphony and the Lyric Opera. Um, I wanted to, to tell you that the first question uh, that you have is about uh, overuse syndrome. And today um, I'm gonna be offering another perspective for overuse syndrome with, with Dr. Uh, Marite and Dr. Mark that points the uh, root cause as possibly coming from pelvic uh, dysfunction and not entirely from the point where you're feeling symptoms. And I learned this the hard way. So in other words, if you're having chronic uh, shoulder pain or chronic uh, hand pain or back pain, neck pain, it, it can be symptomatic that you're feeling it there. And I know you all know about the spine uh, being the source of many pains, but talking about the SI joint in specific, uh, the weight bearing joint of the body. If you've ever had a sprain there, um, like you fell on your back or you had a child, women are more prone to that. And you, you know, you sprained your pelvis that left untreated can make your entire structure change over time and cause tremendous uh, problems with your body and with playing. And I wanna to go to my story now, briefly, as briefly as I can, because it's a long story, to show you the, uh, all of the things that happened to me over the period of 26 years. Uh, my daughter, uh, my second child was born in 1995. She's a wonderful uh, professional jazz artist now, singer, and I'm glad she was born, but I pushed her out very quickly because I play the clarinet and I have strong diaphragm. So I pushed her out very quickly and I ended up with a pelvic sprain and I had trouble walking for about a month. Um, I sought out uh, chiropractic help at that time. I actually had a chiropractor I was seeing anyway, so we kept working with my sprain and it just uh, felt better and better. But um, I did not know that I was really not in alignment in my pelvis. Um, and so starting about 2000, she was born in 1995, starting about 2000, I noticed that um, I had some intermittent shaking in my tone. And then I also was starting to experience uh, low back pain kind of chronically. And I had an MRI and I thought maybe I had a disc problem, but that nothing showed up. I had hip pain. I couldn't lift anything over 15 pounds without feeling pain in my low back. 
Um, I also uh, had some numbness in my feet. Um, and I noticed um, that I, I couldn't walk. Like it didn't seem like my gait was correct. Like I forgot how to walk. Um, so in about 2007, the shaking in my tone um, became more prominent. And uh, so I mostly had trouble with sustained playing. So I, I could play fine if I was articulating or, or orchestral work, but in chamber music, when I had uh, slower movements, it was just getting to be more and more difficult to play. Uh, and then in 2010, um, I just, just kind of gave up on my work with my chiropractor because I just felt like I had all these symptoms and nothing was getting better. So I sought out a physical therapist. She was a top physical therapist. She um, worked with the Chicago Symphony and Lyric Opera musicians and um, was highly, highly respected. I went to her and um, she noticed that I had a twist in my body. My torso was twisted to the left somewhat. And so we did physical therapy for that twist for several years. I worked with her a total of six years. Um, and then we noticed that my left leg was quite a bit shorter. So we had a, a lift put in my shoe, my left uh, shoe, so that um, you know my legs would be even. Um, I worked with her for a long time. Um, I, um, ne I, my leg kept getting shorter and my twist wasn't going away. And so we weren't asking the question of why was I twisting and why was my left leg um, getting shorter? So um, after like $15,000 of physical therapy and chiropractic over these years between 1995 and 2010, uh, or, or even past that, I mean, it was like 2000. 15 that I kept working the same way, I was getting uh, worse and worse. And after doing uh, my Telemann recording, uh, where I, I recorded the flute unaccompanied uh, Telemann uh, flute fantasias that came out in two, six, 2016, I found it just more and more difficult to play. I, I couldn't uh, blow my air properly. I couldn't take in a, a breath properly. I developed a soft palate leak. Um, my neck was torqued to the right and uh, it was putting pressure on my carotid artery. I prolapsed my bladder. I mean, all the air pressure that I was blowing was going down instead of up and through my instrument. In fact, um, I started using Legere reeds and I noticed that my air pattern, because you can see which way your air is going, started up the right hand corner and went out the left hand side of the reed about a, less than a third of an inch down the, the reed. So my air was literally going out the side of the reed instead of into the clarinet. And um, my rib cage was pressing uh, on uh, my heart. I was getting dizzy and a lot. And um, I, as I said, I had spent a, a, about $15,000 on physical therapy, trying to figure out what was wrong with me. By the grace of God, um, I found Dr. Mark and Marite Grothman. And I learned that they worked with uh, br the breath and with musicians. And uh, I decided to try another uh, another group of practitioners. Um, at that point, I could barely play a scale. So I would sit in my practice room literally for hours just trying to get through what I wanted to practice, uh, having trouble even playing a C major scale. And um, so what was the problem? You know, I had looked at everything. I didn't know. I went in for uh, to their clinic and they gave me an x-ray. Wow. They saw that I had an a severe SI joint sprain long-term that was untreated. And being a wind player meant that I was putting pressure, wind pressure on my body. And it was actually increasing the symptoms of SI joint problems a lot because the pressure uh, was twisting my body and disabling my diaphragm and disabling my core muscles. Um, my entire structure was, was, uh, was out of alignment. I mean, every bone in my body 
was not in the right place. It was like a broken frame on a car. And uh, the shaking was caused from one lung moving all the wind with only pushing. I could only push the air out and the other lung not really in sync with that. So that's what the shaking was come, coming from. And if you know any wind players with shaking in their tone, how devastating that is. And so this was what I was going through. So they started um, SOT, sacroccipital therapy with me. I used, um, which aligns the pelvis. I used an SI joint belt, which is kind of like holding the, holding your body together. Um, I literally wore that 24 hours a day for about two years. I did pelvic exercises to strengthen my core and gradually my skeleton after almost, uh, after two and a half years of work, I actually now for, for three years has become un completely untwisted. My core is, is completely functioning. My diaphragm works properly. I can float my tone. Articulation is a breeze and I'm back to the way I used to feel or better than when I, than I felt in, in decades. Now I played the Mozart clarinet concerto with the Lake Forest symphony before we folded uh, to uh, right before COVID. And it, I'm, a, I just, I'm so much better now that I'm, I'm so grateful for this work. Um, and all I can say is that I believe this is a breakthrough in wind playing and uh, diagnosing problems that we have to look at the SI joint as part of the picture when we're looking at overuse and um, br breathing problems, because uh, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Mark, but I can tell you that he told me that 85% of his patients who come in with various symptoms have the underlying symptom being the SI joint dysfunction. And so if you think about the SI joint as the major weight bearing joint of your body, if that's out of alignment, if your pelvis is out of alignment, then your whole body structure starts to shift. And if that's not fixed and you just do symptomatic treatment, I'm telling the story of probably the worst it could get before quitting my career you won't have a career if you don't fix it. So I want to um, send this over to Dr. Mark now and um, tell the story, Dr. Mark. Oh, that's exciting. You're a tough act to follow, Kathy. <laughs> I want to thank you all for uh, having us on this uh, presentation this morning. Uh, it's been a challenging year and a half, a very polarizing year and a half. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, let's start by just introducing uh, Marite and me, and then I want to introduce chiropractic to those of you who are not familiar with chiropractic. And then the bulk of the half an hour that we have together will be spent talking about uh, chronic pelvic sprain injuries. Uh, Marite uh, is from France. She was a nurse. Uh, she majored in psychiatry. She started studying nutrition and homeopathy and iridology, a lot of reflex work. Uh, and she came here to study in, in uh, Lombard, Illinois, in Chicago suburbs. I was a preacher's kid from Wisconsin. Uh, I have a, a pretty strong uh, music background myself, uh, singing all the time in my dad's church, uh, in any church I could get to. And um, in seventh grade, I switched from piano to trumpet. Uh, I love trumpet. I never got first chair. I was second chair all the time. Uh, and my heart would flutter a little bit whenever I had a little solo, but uh, I enjoyed those years and years of trumpet, played into my college years. Um, and I was just enthralled with uh, biology, with, with bugs and spiders and frogs and cats. And it's my love of anatomy and uh, organisms that led me into chiropractic. Rita and I met in the school, in, the, in chiropractic school in the late 70s. And right after we met, she said, you know, we're going to do SOT as our primary technique. And I said, well, gosh, that's great, darling. Uh, what's SOT? And she had a big group of chiropractic friends in France who were very, very excited about SOT. So in our second semester of school, 
we started going to SOT seminars and five, six, seven seminars a year, uh, some more seminars the next year. The last two years of school, I was president of the SOT club. Uh, by the time we finished, we had well over 30 seminars under our belt. Uh, we just traveled around the country in an old 69 Chevy cargo van. Um, but those were, those were exciting years. Uh, I've had dozens and dozens and dozens of people walk through the office and shadow us to see what an SOT clinic looks like. I'm excited to share that with you. Uh, so that's how we got involved in SOT. Uh, SOT in the United States is very prevalent on the East Coast and the West Coast. It's a little bit of a void here in the Midwest where we live. Uh, we opened our practice in 84, and uh, we've added a number of different uh, techniques in addition to SOT. But uh, SOT has been the framework of all of the structural work that we do, and I'm excited to share it with you. SOT is different uh, because it comes from an osteopathic philosophy, and that philosophy is uh, aligning the cranium and the sacrum, craniosacral work, if you will. Uh, and there are a lot of different techniques that work with craniosacral, SOT being one of them. So there are massage therapists, there are uh, osteopaths, uh, naturopaths, and chiropractors. Chiropractors, for those of you who don't know, have the same um, undergrad training as uh, medical, our medical fellows, the medical doctors. And then after graduating with an undergrad degree in whatever, mine was in, bio, in uh, genetics, molecular biology, then we went to chiropractic school. Chiropractic school is very similar to medical school. Uh, medical school has more pharmacology and more surgery. Chiropractic has more biomechanics and structural work. Uh, after graduation, most chiropractors hang their shingle and go out as a family doctor, much like the, the doc that you'd see on the old cowboy shows, right? That's a doc and, and they deliver babies and set broken bones and mend wounds and they do they do it all in the modern world medical professionals have really really specialized and that is good and it's bad uh, it's good because after graduating as a general practitioner a gp medical doctor now you do and i don't know the numbers maybe three or four years of orthopedics and then another three or four years of orthopedic surgery and then another three or four years of hand. And then after who knows 10, 12 more years, you're a hand surgeon. Uh, so chiropractors usually do not go to that length of specialization. One of the problems with the highly specialized medical model is this blinders effect, where uh, a patient will come in and say, I have an overuse injury. I have uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. And uh, the specialist can say, oh, let's put the blinders on. Let's look at the wrist and look at that. There's an entrapment here. If we can release that entrapment, we can reduce the symptoms. Believe it or not, I believe that that carpal tunnel syndrome is often caused by, <laughs> often caused by a weak pelvis. And we're going to discuss how that can happen. It's just amazing. Uh, so the chiropractors are, are very well educated and uh, generally kind of a GP status, if you will. Let's look at SOT. SOT was developed in the, I'm going to say, late 20s, early 30s. And by the 40s, it incorporated the use of some padded wedges underneath the pelvis, the, the hips. Uh, and the treatment can be done on a patient on the patient's back where the patient is lying on his or her back, or it can be done lying face down. The treatment done on the back typically tightens the pelvis, and the treatment done face down generally loosens the lower back and pelvis. So they have little different functions. The SOT divides pelvic dysfunction into three categories category one, category two, and category three, very simple. And uh, what we're going to concentrate on today is category two. C 
Category two is a chronic sprain of the pelvis. Now I'd like to correct a couple of the things that Kathy said, um, and, and I don't have to go into specifics, but a, a category two pelvis, a chronic sprain of the pelvis is just like a, chron uh, a sprain of the ankle. So think about uh, walking on a golf course and you look at something, step on a twig, your ankle rolls and you tear the ligaments on the outside of the ankle, the ankle swells up and you start limping. I'm gonna get up from my chair here so you can see my tummy. And when you have a, a sprain, you're gonna walk over on the side and you're gonna put the weight on to the good ankle. That wasn't a good example, but there's this weight bearing shift and it's this weight bearing shift that is at the foundation of category two symptomatology. So when does a category two start? So in a category two equals, a category two equals a sprained pelvis. Specifically, we're talking about the joints on each side of the tailbone. They're called sacroiliac joints. In the anatomical world, the sacrum is that middle portion, the tailbone, if you will. And then the pelvis has the two big hip bones that come, come around where you uh, would sit a baby on, you know, if you're carrying a baby on your side, those are the, the hip bones or the anominates. So the joints we're talking about are in the back. They're, um, if you don't mind, they're, they're down below the belt right here. Can you see? Yeah, yeah. see. Uh, it's hard with dark pants. And those joints have been injured. There's an injury. If you get in a car accident and you slam your knee into the dash, the force travels up through one thigh and rips the pelvis. You fall onto your hands and knees and you rip the pelvis. You fall on a slippery sidewalk, boom, and you rip the pelvis. You slip on the steps. Boom, boom, boom. You rip the pelvis. This usually happens at a very young age. And at a very young age, you shake it off and it's no big deal. So when Kathy says, I sprained my pelvis delivering my second baby, I would beg to differ. I believe that Kathy unknowingly sprained her pelvis many, many years earlier. And then when you're a kid and you're running around kids actually run around now, I hope, instead of sitting in front of their cell phones, we would just run around and play frisbee and hide and seek and just running all the time. And the muscles compensate for those torn ligaments. So there's this compensation going on. And then we get into college and we're sitting a little bit more studying and we're practicing our clarinets and then, or we get a job and we're sitting as a secretary and we're sitting, 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 and we have a couple of babies and we put on eight pounds and we lose a little muscle tone and, 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 and then all of a sudden you're 36 years old and you start to get these gnawing little symptoms. And those symptoms are the result of that slip and fall on that icy sidewalk when you were four and a half years old but it took that long to develop. We call that from four and a half years old to 36, we call that a subacute condition. What does that mean? Subacute means that you have something, but you don't know it. Let's look at a couple other examples of a subacute condition. How about high blood pressure? Do you think you could walk around for years with high blood pressure and not even know it? Let's look at diabetes. Could you walk around with unregulated sugar in your blood for a long time and have no idea? You go in for a routine blood test and it's like, oh my goodness, look at these sugar levels. Do you think that could happen? Could you have cancer and not even know it? No symptoms at all. That's why they do uh, pap smears and mammograms to find subacute conditions. And we could go on and on and on and on. Another example is arthritis. I, I have uh, many, many people who have arthritis of the hip, for example. 
for 20 years, 30 years, absolutely no symptoms uh, to the patient. Maybe it's a little harder to tie their shoe or a little harder to do something. And they think, well, I guess I'm a little older. I guess that's normal. Uh, but there is arthritis. And then all of a sudden, they get out of bed one morning and there's sharp pain in the hip. And it's like, well, where did that come from? It's been developing over 30 years. And that's exactly the same thing that happens with a category two. So a category two is a, a sprained pelvis. So it, it's a, an injury. And then years and years and years of this chronicity create this myriad of symptoms. Let's talk about how that happens. I want you to think about walking across an ice skating rink in dress shoes with a leather sole. You're walking across and you're slipping and, and, and your, your neck muscles are tightened up and you're trying not to fall. Uh, you're not very relaxed, are you? And that's what happens to the body when you have a chronic pelvic sprain. There's a weight bearing shift and then there's tension. I don't know. Uh, let me just say it. It's a little complicated, but there's this pump that moves cerebral spinal fluid through the brain and spinal cord the cranial sacral pump. It goes pump, 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 back and forth. That pump is disrupted with a pelvic sprain and the pelvis is over pumping. And so the head and neck tighten down to protect the brain reflexly from this over pumping of fluid. So when you have a chronic category two sprained pelvis, we wind up with tension in the neck, and for the lady that held her hand up, uh, the tension in the neck pulls up the first couple ribs, compresses the neurovascular bundle that goes down to the hand. And then with clarinet or typing or whatever, we get carpal tunnel. The car yes, there is um, an overuse syndrome, but God designed our bodies to handle overuse. Our bodies are designed to take it. Trust me, I'm a doctor. So what happens is, yes, we have the overuse, but our bodies can't heal up every night. We can't charge the battery every night because of this chronic tension in the neck. What category two treatment does by correcting the pelvis, by aligning and stabilizing the pelvis. Kathy was talking about aligning the pelvis. They align my pelvis. But it's not only aligning the pelvis, we give specific homework to the patients, specifically a walking regimen. We start with short, frequent walks and develop longer walks, ideally 30 minutes a day with maybe one or two long walks per month, two, three hours, maybe a couple times a month. What's the walking for? It's to specifically strengthen the pelvis to hold the adjustments. And then over time, over a year or two, as that pelvis gets stronger and stronger and stronger, like it was when you were a child, when those symptoms were subacute, you didn't have the symptoms, this tension in the neck relaxes, and now the body can heal up the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, whatever it is. Can I just interject one little thing? Love to. So what I have found, now, I'm 64, and I have no pain anymore. I don't get tired. My hands don't get tired. I'm not getting pains in my back anymore, my neck. Uh, I, I, you know, it doesn't matter how long I need to practice or how long I need to play. I'm like a, a greased wheel, you know, and that was not my experience when I was younger. So this is what related to what you're saying. Yes. Let's, let's spend a moment and talk about the, the symptomatology related to a category, T, a category two. You might be saying to yourself, uh, well, do I have a pelvic sprain, right? Who would be the best person to tell you if you have a pelvic sprain? Your dentist? Your preacher? How about an SOT practitioner, right? There are some dentists actually that are certified SOT practitioners. They have studied because of this relationship with the pelvis and the cranium, the head and neck complex, they can't get a good correction on the bite or temporal mandibular joint dysfunction without handling the underlying pelvic distortion. 
So uh, a number, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dentists, we call them functional dentists all over the country, all over the world, work hand in hand with SOT practitioners, with SOT concentrating on uh, the relationship between head and neck, and then the dentist doing the fine tuning work to help that whole complex to stabilize and heal up. Let's look at some of the symptoms. When we have an acute sprain of the pelvis, it becomes chronic and we start to get this compensation. One of the first things I see is a little stiffness when you wake up in the morning. You're just a little stiff, could be stiff in the neck, could be stiff in the back, but just a little stiffness when you wake up in the morning. And that comes from no movement. It comes from lying in bed for six and a half, seven, eight, nine hours. And that movement that you get during the day is actually pumping the fluid out of the sacroiliac joints. Just like a sprained ankle is swollen, a sprained pelvis is swollen. One of the first things we do with a category two patient is recommend ice packs over the tailbone 30 minutes every day for at least two months, up to six months, maybe nine months. Ice pack, ice pack, ice pack, ice pack, ice pack. Why do we use ice packs? So you don't have to go in and get a steroid injection into this joint, right? Let's just keep it conservative. It's an anti-inflammatory. We see professional athletes doing that all the time. Uh, doing, you know, uh, a baseball pitcher will put ice pack on the elbow. So ice pack over the tailbone. Uh, I don't even know where I was. Well, you're, you're going to talk about uh, different places to look for SOT, correct? I, I'll get there. I, I just wanted to get into the symptoms. Yeah, other symptoms. So we started with uh, stiffness in the morning, especially low back, and then it kind of works out within 15, 20 minutes. And it's like, oh, it's just normal stiffness because I'm getting a little bit older. And then we get grinding of the teeth, uh, temporal mandibular, headaches, dizziness, ringing in the ear, and then shoulder, elbow, hand, wrist. Uh, even, this is hard for some people to get, but even uh, heel spurs. I had a, a middle-aged lady come in. She was a triathlete and uh, her friend was a triathlete, referred her in and she had heel spur, heel spur, heel spur, heel spur. And we examined her and she had a blown pelvis. She had a chronic a weakness of the pelvis causing a weight-bearing shift and she was banging on that left heel way too much because she was shifted to the left. So I recommended getting her centered and let God heal her heel up or let herself heal. Uh, she, she didn't get it, never saw her again. Uh, some people just don't get it. But that's, you would say, my goodness, how can heel pain be related to my tailbone? And that's just the way it works. Yeah, I, I just want to say, remind you, how could shaking in your tone be related to your pelvis. I'm gonna tell you, if you have shaking your tone and you used to breathe properly and your diaphragm was working just fine when you were 18 and 19 and 20 and 25, suddenly you can't blow a, a long line because your tone is shaking. You're like, gosh, what's happened? You know, you, oh, I'm not taking a big enough breath. Oh, but where's the shake? You, I'm gonna tell you that that that's like, I didn't know what it was, but you would never go look at your pelvis, right? Most people wouldn't, but it could be coming from SI joint sprain. That's a good point. And then, and then frankly, you know, we, we find what we do, right? So let's say you have a problem, a symptom, and you go to a chiropractor that specializes in upper neck. That's all they do is upper neck, upper neck, upper neck. And you go into them and you say, well, doc, what's going on? And they evaluate the upper neck and there is a uh, misalignment. And it's like, there's misalignment. And if we fix that misalignment and let God heal your body, get, let you heal your body, uh, it should get better. And so they, they're looking at the upper neck. So upper cervical chiropractor is going to look at the upper neck. An SOT doctor is going to look at your pelvis. We're going to look for the signs and symptoms, the objective and the subjective indicators pointing to a chronically weak pelvis. And then our goal is to align and stabilize. Typically, uh, 
many of you probably don't go to chiropractors, but typically a uh, treatment regimen would be uh, three visits per week for uh, a couple of months, maybe two visits a week for a couple of months, uh, every two weeks for half a year, once a month for a year or two, and then maybe four times a year. That's kind of would be good planning, but it takes, it takes three times a week, three times a week to train that pelvis neurologically to hold. Um, overweight, being overweight is um, a, a negative factor in healing, uh, diabetes, you know, so the, the sicker the person is, maybe the harder it is to hold that, but you just, you just start with what you get and you just try to right the ship a little bit and change just a little bit where the patient is going. Uh, let me review here a little bit. Uh, SOT is a chiropractic technique that has divided pelvic dysfunction into three categories, category one, two, and three. Uh, today, we're talking about category two pelvis. It's an acute sprain, an acute tear of the pelvis that has become chronic. The weak ligaments allow overmotion. If that continues to happen, that overmotion causes degeneration at the next bone up in line, L5 and then the next bone up in line, L4, and then the next bone up. So from an SOT doctor perspective, when I take an X-ray of the waist bones, the lumbar vertebra, and see chronic degeneration, not local accident degeneration, but chronic degeneration, I'm thinking we've got a weak pelvis causing too much motion in those bones, and then the body compensates by laying in of bone. Can I just say, I want to say one thing about this. This also for me brings up a point of about stretching and doing yoga. When you feel discomfort in a, uh, your spine, a lot of us will stretch. I did yoga and stretching and yoga and stretching and chiropractic, normal chiropractic for years and years and years. And by doing that, I was actually causing it to be weaker and weaker. And this is the, this is also another That's thing. Correct, Kathy. So I, I just, you know, be, when you feel a discomfort, you want to rub it or stretch it or whatever, because that's what we know, but that was actually making it worse. Yeah. And there, there are some stretches that we can do that are beneficial, but there are some stretches that we want to avoid. Uh, let, let me share with you the two websites where you can go online and look for an SOT chiropractor and try to find an SOT practitioner in your area. So I'll give you just a moment, grab a, a pen and paper, uh, and I'll get to those in just a minute. And then I'm going to try to wrap up here in a couple of minutes and then see what we have for Q&A. And that will help me direct uh, the last little bit of our time together. So site number one, if everybody's ready, is soto-usa.com. S-O-T-O hyphen U-S-A dot com. Uh, that stands for Sacro Occipital Technique Organization in the USA. There's also a Soto Europe. Uh, my son is a chiropractor in the center of France. He's a member of Soto Europe. They have a Soto, I'm not sure if it's a Soto Asia or Soto Japan, and they have a Soto Australia. Uh, so it's a, a very international group. So for those of you who are international, um, just check, but just check sacro occipital teaching organization. Oh. I'm not sure exactly, but soto-usa.com. Go to the find a doctor tab. And then both of these organizations that I share with you have certification programs. The Soto USA has a CSP level one and a CSP level two. So a certified SOT practitioner level one has gone to a couple seminars and they know how to block or, or use the wedges for the pelvis. And the certified SOT practitioner level two actually has gone on and learned more of the reflex work and uh, some of the cranial work. And then they actually have some actually craniopaths uh, at higher and higher levels. So 
uh, if you're able to find a doctor in your area, if they are certified uh, CSP level one or ideally CSP level two, so much the better. And experience matters. The second website is sourci.com, S-O-R-S-I, S-O-R-S-I.com, uh, Sacro Occipital Research Society International. Uh, they have the same type of thing. It's two groups teaching the same things, but it's different doctors. Most doctors have a membership in either one or the other. I kept a membership in both organizations for a long time. Uh, now I'm just with uh, Soto USA, but they're both fine organizations. If you go to the Find a Doctor tab, their certification is just a little bit different. They have a uh, certified um, proficient and they have an advanced proficient and then certified craniopath. Um, and they will direct you if you go to either of those two websites, you can learn a little bit more about category one, category two, category three. Uh, it's an exciting, exciting uh, technique. We've been doing this for um, well over 40 years. Um, it's, it's truly amazing. Uh, Jessica, let's, let's just open this up to Q and A. If there are any questions for us. There are, there's questions in the chat, right? Let's see. Yes, I, I have a question here from Jody. What percentage of patients who come to you, do you find actually have pelvic sprain? Um, I guess they all do, 100%. And, and what happens is, remember we were talking about how many people haven't fallen down? I mean, you're, you're learning to walk, boom, learning. And it just it's just part of life. So uh, some people actually manage the pelvic sprain. They compensate for it. And so it doesn't show up as needing treatment, but uh, everybody's got it. And then if it's in there for long enough, it can cause degeneration up into the lower back. And we actually have to treat what's going on in the, in the waist before we get to the pelvic sprain, which we believe is the underlying cause. So it's, it's high, 75, 80, 85%. What other questions do we have um, in the chat here? Anybody else have any questions? While we're waiting for those other questions to come in, I do have a couple of things to add, uh, if we have just a second. And um, first of all, I am so grateful to Joel at Bakun who introduced me to Catherine. Um, and her symptoms and her history very much aligned with my own. And I'm so appreciative of the conversations that we have had that have helped me with my own health. Um, I have a practitioner that does craniosacral and rolfing, and he has been very attentive in this area as well. Um, and it's just such great information. And Dr. Mark, um, I'm, I'm so grateful that you're here today and you were willing to do this for us. Um, I, I did want to talk a little bit about from a musician's perspective, what kind of things we're seeing and what kind of things we're responding to. But before I do that, I just wanted to say that your information comes from the source of why we have problems. And oftentimes as musicians, because we're not trained, we come to this topic as uh, an approach to symptoms. Um, which is to me extremely dangerous because uh, if we don't get to the source and we're trying to treat one symptom, at least in my experience, I have developed additional issues. <laughs> um, and so that's just my perspective, but we do have some important resources that I thought I'd bring up for musicians who are coming uh, into some overuse injuries and they have questions. And I won't get into details because we don't have a lot of time, but there is this resource here. This is called the Musician's Survival Manual that was put together by Ixom in 1988. Um, and in this particular resource, the reason I like it for, for teachers to at least understand, uh, Richard Norris presents 12 factors that predispose musicians to injury. And I think it's important for us as teachers and musicians to at least understand what those 12 factors are so that we can hopefully prevent some of the overuse injuries that uh, are most common uh, in when musicians or in musicians in general. 
And then two resources for if you are injured and you're struggling to kind of find your way, first of all, find a great doctor that knows how to find the source, which is expensive sometimes and difficult to do. But trust me and Catherine, <laughs> it's worth yeah. every penny. Every I was going to say, if I, if I had known about SOT, I mean, how, how would you know? You don't know, like, like I said, God's grace, really, literally, that was yeah. like, I was seeking out. I knew what was, I was working on. It just wasn't getting, something was really still wrong and getting worse and worse and worse. Right. So. Absolutely. And I think all the money that I spent early on getting the wrong answers and the wrong treatment is more frustrating to me than all of the money that I have spent with the right information since, <laughs> even though it's more money. Uh, I will say this is a really great book for injured musicians. This is called Playing Less Hurt. Uh, and it's by Janet Korvath, who was, uh, is a musician who dealt with a very serious injury and her life story, as well as um, her advice from her doctors and her medical team, how to rebuild her career and her artistry. And one other one that I like, if you're just looking for resources, this one is called The Athletic Musician. Um, and it's by Barbara Paul and Christine Harrison. And it's got fantastic information in there as well about how to treat your body more like an athlete when you're a musician. Uh, since you do put your body through this rigorous routine, especially professional musicians who are just kind of at it all day, all day, all day. Um, and uh, one last thing, and then we'll get back to those questions. I, I will say that I think music schools in general are starting to do a much better job about trying to get young musicians to understand that their body needs to be healthy. Your nutrition needs to be healthy. Your sleep needs to be healthy. Your routine and your exercise need to be healthy. Um, but I still don't think that we present enough information to music students on, on these topics, how to have a healthy body and also how to prevent injury, how to avoid those factors. Uh, and so as, as educators, uh, I think that the, the book that Richard Norris put together for uh, Exam is a great resource to kind of just give yourself some basic information for your students. So anyway, thank you. And, and if you have any questions, go ahead with those. I was noticing the question, you mentioned exercise that should not be done. Please provide an example. Um, I can tell you from what uh, I've read on, uh, S on um, SI joint dysfunction, like reaching to, to stretch your body down, you know, reaching for your toes to the ground, that's probably something that you should not do, you know, and when you're gonna pick up something, don't bend over to do it. Why don't you give some more examples? Okay, uh, thank you, Mary, for your, uh for sharing. I wanted to talk, we can talk about uh, diet and mental attitude and so many other things. And I, this SOT category two complex is so important. I wanted to kind of concentrate on the structural biomechanics. If you think about the pelvis, uh, I, I taught anatomy for a couple of years after chiropractic school. Uh, the word pelvis came from the Greek word for bowl. And in the medical circles, the pelvis, if you can see my hand, is it's thought of like a container to contain the, the uterus and the bladder and the colon and all of those things are just held in that container. And it's thought to be a fixed container, like a, a utility sink. <laughs> and in chiropractic, it actually moves. There's a little joint in the front and then the pelvis and it, it moves. So when you ask, what are the stretches to avoid? It's anything that is going to overstretch those joints. The absolute worst is vacuuming. And by vacuuming, I mean pushing and pulling a floor vacuum, push pull, that twisting motion is, is one of the worst things you can do. Uh, waxing your boat, uh, uh, cleaning a, the side of a shower wall, but that push pull, push pull. Uh, one of the things we talk about a lot is avoiding crossing your legs or, uh, you know, sitting Indian style with the uh, knees flared out to the side. That's going to tend to open the pelvis. So you want to stay centered and work with walking. Try to avoid that push pull. Hills too. I was just 
reading about hills are not a good idea. Hills are okay as long as you don't overstride. Uh, if you're cross country skiing and you have a big long stride, that can be too much for somebody recovering from a weak category two. So just smaller strides. When you're walking, try not to really go after it with big strides. Shorten your stride up a little bit when you're walking and it will be less uh, irritating. Avoid heel strike. Uh, try to try to walk on your toes uphill with shorter strides. Yeah, I am um, uh, also noticed um, that if if I was uh, just it, it, like if you're you're sitting up in bed and your feet are straight and you're gonna lit, reach for something, that's not a good idea, right? Yeah. And those a lot of those are a lot of those are specifics that can you can do specifically, you know, based on how your body is put together. Each person is a little different. Let me give you a couple of ideas that you can use tomorrow morning or today to help even if you have a chronically weak pelvis, and most of us do. Number one, we said to instigate or, or start a little walking program. Start with short, frequent walks, work up to a half an hour a day, half an hour a day. Uh, use ice pack over the tailbone. You take a, a five inch by 10 inch ice pack. It's a, a gel pack. It's, it's uh, flexible. It's not like those hard things you throw in a lunchbox and you stick it in your pants in the back below the belt, below where the belt is. Your pants will hold it in place and you can uh, walk around the house. You could actually go and walk for 30 minutes with that ice pack on. Usually you don't like to put that frozen gel pack right against your skin. Otherwise you can get what's called a freezer burn. So just a little, maybe a, a dish towel or a, a t-shirt between the ice pack and your skin. So ice, walk, try to break up your sitting. Try to avoid having your head go forward into the little old lady posture. So I'm going to go to the side now. Try to avoid letting your head go forward. As your head goes forward, you're placing a tremendous strain on the lower back and it just gets harder and harder to fix. We use the term head back, shoulders back. So when head back, it's not this, it's straight back. So head back, shoulders back. And get in the habit of walking with your head back, shoulders back, and it'll take a lot of the strain off the pelvis and off of all the other parts of the body. So ice, walk, uh, keep the head back. And then there's a little stretch we do. It's called a standing back bend. When you're done with your practice session, you've been sitting, bent over your instrument, uh, get up from the chair, put your instrument down, and put your fists back next to your tailbone and lean backward. So I'll, I'll show you what it looks like here. You wanna check the camera? You stand up, fists go back where the belt is, and then you lean back. In yoga, you bend the head back, you're looking straight ahead. So think about breaking a stick. You wanna bend backward. And this is similar to what we do in the treatment with the padded wedges. So just a standing back bend. It lasts about five or six seconds and you usually breathe out as you're bending backwards. So you stand up, spread your feet, lock your knees, fists go under the belt, bend backward and breathe out. It's a wonderful little stretch. You could do that every hour, all day long. You said we couldn't see that. Okay. So you wanna do that one again? All right. He's gonna do it again. So stand up, fists go down low, oops down here and bend backward and it's just six seconds i wanted to add to this um when you're walking make sure you're engaging your core muscles and letting your legs be loose and not tight i that's one thing that now that my core is stronger i'm using my core a lot more when i'm walking and and not tightening my hips and my legs and not only core, but remember head back, shoulders back. You just have good posture. We like to see people get into their 90s with no knee replacements, no hip replacements, no hearing aids, no medication, all their teeth in their mouth, just natural. That's, that's the goal. Yeah. 
right? Simple stuff. Jessica, do are there any quick questions uh, left? I think that's all the questions we have, but uh, we do need to wrap up because I have to get the next session started. But if you could provide uh, contact information, if you're willing to have people with any additional questions, could you let us know what that would be? I'll give you my contact information. It's uh, uh, Grothman Clinic, G-R-O-T-H-M-A-N. We're in the Chicago suburbs. It's uh, 845 North Lake Street, Aurora, Illinois, A-U-R-O-R-A, 60506. Give them your email. Uh, the office number is uh, area code 630-844-1244. And my email, it's my personal email, is clinic at earthlink.net. And I wanted to just give you my email. If you had any questions for me, Kathy with a K, K-A-T-H-Y-P-I-R-T-L-E at sbcglobal.net. Okay. All of those contact information are there in the chat. Um, and the, the links that were discussed earlier are now up on the website and on the guidebook. So if you miss those, you can catch those on those resources. And thank you all so much for such a great session. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that more people are talking about these types of therapies. Um, I actually had a cranial sacral therapy last week to deal with migraines. So <laughs> this is very topical for me. So thank you thank so much, you. everybody. We love all of you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.